So turkey wheat, along with red fife wheat, is a land race wheat. And what that means is essentially it's an old genetic sort of godfather variety. You know, most modern wheats, you take them out of the place that they've been bred, and they just don't really function anymore. You know, they either keel over and die, or they just don't develop properly. But if you go back to like these old land race varieties, they can travel all over the world and sort of re-establish themselves. They're genetically flexible. They're genetically dynamic. Um, so when we were trying to figure out a wheat for our farmer to grow four years ago here in the mountains, you know, we went with turkey because it's genetically flexible. I've been told it has 40 different genetic iterations it can bring about to survive in a different place, you know, or in a different soil. Wow. Um, you know, so we brought this wheat here, and sure enough, we really, you know, had a really good harvest that first year. Um, and like right now, there's turkey wheat all the way over on the coast of North Carolina. There's turkey wheat here in the mountains. Mm -hmm. This came from a farmer up in Ohio in Bluffton named Tim King. Um, him and his neighbor Phil Kingsley both grow red fife, turkey red, and spelt wheat for us. Um, and they really like it because they're they're sort of old-fashioned farmers. They're you know their farm is called Swiss Heritage Farm. They like growing older grains. They grow organically. They like the fact that these old wheats grow up really tall. They grow above the weeds. They're great for organic systems, as were the modern kind of dwarfed wheats that they were growing for a while. Just weren't that suited to the type of farming that they liked. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's a good partnership for them. It's a wheat that works well with their farming systems, and for us, it's a, it's a wheat that works well with our baking systems, you know, and so that's why, that's why the relationship works. Yeah. Um, so, this mill is an Austrian mill that we have here primarily because it runs slowly, and, you know, the focus of what we're doing is trying to essentially preserve flavor from the grains that we're using. And I wanted a mill that turned slowly that wouldn't generate heat. And I wanted a mill that was going to rub the fragrant oils from the grain right into the starch. So that even after we sift out bran to make lighter flowers, we're still preserving the aromatic germ oils of the grain. And you know, for us, that's like the heart. That's like the heart of the flower right there is that germ oil. So, you know, if you could feel this flower, it would feel kind of oily and sort of cakey. That's because it has the oils preserved in it. So that goes into making much more flavorful breads. Yeah, much more aromatic bread. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, there's, you know, there's the starch in a grain, which, I mean, anyone who's had a baguette knows what the starch tastes like. It's just, you know, it's mildly sweet, but it's just kind of crisp and kind of very subdued. And then anyone who's had 100% whole wheat bread knows what the bran tastes like, essentially. That's like a lot of bran flavor there. It's bitter, it's astringent, you know. Um, but the, the unique kind of aromas that come out of a grain are locked up in that germ. And most industrial whole grain milling, they separate the starch, the germ, and the bran. And then generally the starch and the bran are recombined and the germ is lost because the germ is perishable because it's an oil. So you're not getting those good aromas and you're not getting, you know, the, the healthy kind of fatty acids that come in the germ oil either. Um, so, you know, this is what some people call single pass stone milling or intact stone milling. Um, but really it's just stone milling the way stone milling a flower existed for, you know, forever. Um, you can see down there, that stone right there, that's called the bedstone. Okay. Yeah. And so the way the stone mill works is essentially you got a bedstone that's stationary. And then up top in this housing, you've got a runner stone. When you turn it on, the grain falls between them and the runner stone, you know, it's running on the top, it's grinding your flour, and all the components are mixed together. Mm -hmm. So even after you sift out the bran, if you want to make a lighter flour, which we do lots of lighter flours here, it's not just whole grain milling, you're still preserving the oils. You've got a starch that's perfumed with all the elements of the grain. It's not a blank, you know, separate unit. You know, it's not like a blank check or anything. Um, so, throw some more wheat in here and turn it on.
models like this. Yeah, I mean, large-scale milling in the pre-industrial area, they're, uh, you know, essentially this apparatus would be part of a whole building. You know, this, this grain intake area would be like up on the second floor or the third floor, and it would just, you know, the grain would drop down through the floor into the next level of the building, you know, which would be like where your stones were housed. Of the stones, if you wanted to, and work on it, you know, and get the size and thin it out and everything. I mean, yeah, essentially they shrunk the millhouse concept down into a unit and put a motor on the back. Um, you know, like I said, all of our controls over the mill are basically tactile. It's not no punching of buttons involved. You know, put a controller intake.